In this episode, we're going to cover the new and improved Arcader 3 gaming handheld. It's new, improved, and this one's designed specifically for vertical arcade classic games. What? Stick around. Now this product is a new version of something I created over a year ago. It represents the third iteration in a series of custom handheld arcades. I built this as an exercise to both push the limits of the design, software, and consumer grade tools to see just what I could make. I think it came out pretty well. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm constantly looking for ways to do better work. And by that I mean improving upon design, fabrication, and final product by iterating and incorporating everything I learn along the way. Now it's been a while since the Arcader 2 and having a chance to use the handheld more and more over the last few months I've discovered a few things that could be improved. Of the things I decided to change they were driven by the choice to do a few things. One, improve the user experience with the device. Things like how does it feel when you're playing, does it make my fingers sore, are the buttons easy to reach, and frankly do I like playing it. Two, eliminate any unnecessary circuit complexity. So this is a four layer circuit design uh, with around 80 components and let's face it, uh, the fewer the parts, the cheaper it is to make and the easier it is to assemble and support. End of story. So three, improve the design and engineering of the device. So making it easier to build, test, repair and modify with aesthetics, process and tooling in mind. And four, finally to reduce the cost. Look, I'm not trying to compete with large scale marketing of handheld arcade games. But being able to produce more of these one-of-a-kind devices at a lower price is the fun technical challenge that we can all benefit from. So let's get into it. To improve the user experience, I made the following changes. I enlarged the shoulder and trigger buttons for easier dexterity during gameplay. I improved the power button slider designed for smooth operation. I added names to the shoulder and power buttons. Improved the ergonomics of the body design. It's a little more round and smoother. It's easier to hold. I removed the magnetic face and rear back access panel. To address the electronic issue, in Fusion 360 I replaced the HDMI output and added a volume control wheel. I then replaced the composite video for SPI based ILI 9341 displays. This allowed me to remove the 2.5 and 1.8 volt supply circuits, thus simplifying the board. Lastly, I added display footprints for both vertical and horizontal display orientations. Improving the audio design for better sound, I first incorporated a dual isolated 2.5 cubic inch speaker enclosures into the subassembly. And using an online tool, each enclosure was ported and tuned to around 80 hertz, uh, punching up the low end on the system. Although most retro games uh, audio is in the higher frequency, this change helped dampen that tinny sound most handhelds have. Improving the assembly, I first added internal tolerances, allowing for more variance in parts and assemblies. This would prove to be a blessing for variation in board sizes and support for various materials shrink and machine a little bit differently. Toolless assembly of the components with the enclosure, I incorporated standoffs and into the ledges and into the design to provide proper alignment and stability. And next I incorporated an O-ring in the acrylic face to create a compression seal, which is easy to install and can be disassembled if needed. Finally, a unified sub-assembly combines and assembles the internal parts of the body for a great fit. With the electronics, this build required some work, but not because of any complex changes, mostly related to migrating the board and schematic over into Fusion 360, which now supports electronic projects natively. While this isn't a new change for Fusion 360, there were some serious issues early that prevented me from investing too much time with it. Fortunately, many of the buggy issues I faced earlier with the electronics projects have been addressed, and although there are still a few gotchas to work around, the integration has come a long way in the recent months. Merging the project over from Autodesk Eagle was pretty easy, though mastering the new space with a complex project took some time to learn the new tool chain. Way too much to describe in this video, but I can make a follow-up video if it's something that you're interested in. The composite video was no longer needed, as this build went with a SPI-based ILI 9341 display. The 18-pin contacts were wired up to the SPI-0 on the compute module. The footprint was then set up with pads for both portrait and landscape orientations. Portrait for all the vertical shoot 'em ups and landscape for all the side-scrollers. The purpose of this build was to build a Verticade handheld. 
So my main focus on the first couple were to solve for the portrait orientation, even though it's set up for both. Although this board is hosting a Pi Compute Module 3 Plus, that didn't require any changes to support it. The device will run a little cooler, but I decided to keep the active thermal cooling circuit just in case. With the changes complete, it was off to order the boards. Now if you've watched my videos, I always use JLC PCB. They're my go-to board supplier. The process is fast, easy, professional, and the results are always reliable. They came through again this time around, delivering perfect boards for the project. Going through the process on their website was a breeze. You upload your generated CAM files, and the majority of the parameters are pulled automatically from them, making it quite easy. Um, next, you select the specific features like the board and copper thickness, solder mask and silk screen colors, and any extras like solder paste stencil that you're going to need. Three days later, the boards arrive, stencils were inspected, everything looked great. Next was time to assemble. This time around, I built a more legitimate screen printer setup using some butterfly hinges and the frame stencil from JLC PCB. I 3D printed a board holder, then a holder frame. The frame was attached to the printing station and the board was loaded. Next, pulling a thin, even coat of solder paste, prepared the board for assembly. The board holder pops out and makes it a lot easier to handle during uh, part placement. Using my surplus of Arcator bill of material items, the first two prototypes uh, would be hand assembled at my electronics workbench using my AM scope to make the process a little easier. This thing isn't cheap, but it works great. As the majority of the components are 0805 size components, it's pretty easy to assemble by hand. Once assembled, I ran a custom heat profile on my modified T962 reflow oven and the board was baked. Once the SMD parts are baked, I manually install all the through hole components and solder them by hand. To try something different, I made two prototypes this time. One with my traditional soft silicone buttons, as well as one with the classic clicky tactile buttons just to see how they feel during gameplay. Design-wise, although it shares similarities with the Arcator 2, a lot of work went into this one. The enclosure and inner components were redesigned over the course of 200 revisions. Because the complexity and inner tolerances of the internal supports and shape of the body, I chose to model the negative space in the cavity. Basically the space occupied by all the parts when they're in their correct positions. This would then be used as a tool to intersect with the body, hollowing out the negative space. Cross-section analysis then allowed me to evaluate the body wall thickness and adjust accordingly. This was much easier than trying to model that into the body itself. This could have also been done with surface modeling and perhaps next time I'll leverage that to get away from the parametric look of chamfers, fillets, straps, and the likes. A subframe was created to attach the circuit board and hold the components in place while providing structure to the handheld. Also incorporated into the subframe were a couple sealed and ported speaker enclosures tuned around 80 hertz, designed to give a solid performance from the tiny speakers while helping out the low end frequencies. The enclosures were sealed using laser cut vinyl, making it airtight. I used four M3 screws and several standoffs built into the body to bring it all together. Options, shoulder and trigger buttons were made larger to feel better during gameplay. Power button and internal power slider were also redesigned to be easier to operate. Next, to upgrade the acrylic face, a channel was milled around the perimeter and a 1mm diameter o-ring was used to create a compression seal, seating and retaining the face for a solid and toolless finish. Following the previous design, a marquee was laser cut from black vinyl and applied to the rear of the face. The face was then laser engraved to mark the buttons, names, and Arcator logo, of course. In the previous build, the body was CNC milled from several different types of hardwoods. This time around, I decided to print the body in my Form 3 for the excellent surface quality. I printed two assemblies, one in clear and the other in black resin. The clear body was sanded with fine and microfine sanding pads and then clear coated with a UV acrylic coating. This brings the body to near transparency. The black body, on the other hand, was coated with ceramic coat. It's a ceramic infused coating similar to Cerakote, but a little cheaper. The coating feels like a tactical weapon. It's durable and has a ceramic but silky feel. I'm anxious to see how well this holds up. For now, it's pretty awesome. Sliding the subassembly into the body, dropping in the desired D-pad, and sealing up the acrylic face completes the unit. This is one of my favorite builds and I'm pretty happy with the results. So let's demo some of these great arcade classics.
Not bad, right? These vertical arcade classics are unique and very few people take the time to play them on a real vertically oriented monitor. For me, it makes the experience that much more authentic. Now this design allows for the orientation to be changed to horizontal with minimal effort. So I expect to do that at some point, but for now, I already have a few handheld models in that format. I hope you enjoyed watching this process yet again and the details that went into this particular build. That's gonna do it for this video. I hope this inspired you to get out and take on a challenge of a project of your own. If you're new here, please subscribe to the channel and take the extra step and ring that notification bell. It'll help keep you in the loop on future updates. As always, and this makes more sense than ever now, be safe out there, have fun, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, if you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. It's how we're building the community. Also allow me to bring better content. Also check me out on these other social networks. There's lots of cool stuff there too. Thank <laughs> you.